Pen's affiliation with anybody here. And she's going to be joining me in Pen now, too. Thanks, thanks for your introduction. So currently I'm not affiliated to any of the institution now because I graduate and I'm looking forward to move to Stanford. But yeah, so um, today I'm going to talk about random graph matching at other threshold via county chandeliers. So this is a joint work with my amazing co-author Chen Mao from Georgia Tech, Yi Hong from Theo, and my advisor Jiang Mishu from Duke. Um, first, let me show you some motivating examples. The first one is network denominalization, where you have two social networks, but one of them is anonymized, and then the goal is that you want to recover this removed node identities, then by applying the graph matching technique. Oh, it, it, it's actually turned on. It's just like my volume. Okay, maybe I'll hold this. Okay, is that better? All right. So the problem is that you want to recover this removed user identities, and the idea is that if we are friends on one network, it's also very likely that we're friends on another network. Then by applying the graph matching technique, you can utilize the graph structures and then you can recover this removed user identities. The second application is in biology, where you have protein-to-protein -protein interaction networks across this two, this two species. Then by applying the graph matching technique, you can identify proteins with similar functions across two species. The third application is in computer vision, where you can map this two 3D shape of the human body, then you can analyze how human body moves. So these are the applications. But this problem itself is generally hard because uh, in real world, all the network can be on very large scale, especially if you look into this two network. Suppose each one of them only have 100 nodes. The total number of possible node mappings is n factorials, which is 100 factorial, which is already super large. And on the statistical perspective, the two graphs, they may be correlated, but they do not look exactly the same. So all of this leading to the challenging point of this problem. So now let me introduce you this um, popular model where people has been used to study the graph matching model. So this is called correlated Earth chain random graph model. Uh, here is a toy example. So you have two Earth chain random graph. Each one of them have n nodes, and each two nodes are connected with probability Q. And here you can think that they're edgewise correlated in the following sense. So um, they there exist. So the two network correspond to the same group of people from the internal world. And whether, say, Luigi and uh, Mario, they're connected on the first network is correlated with whether they're connected on the second network. And the correlation is captured by parameter rho. So in this example here, rho is point A, so that's why these two networks, they are not isomorphic to each other. And when this correlation gets larger, and they will look more similar to each other in terms of the structure. And the problem here is that uh, suppose I only observe the structure of this two network. Can I find out a way so that I can recover this user identities between these two networks? And here are two key parameters. One is this correlation parameter. So it's, uh, the larger the row is, the problem can be simpler because the, pro the two networks become more similar. The other key parameter is this n times q. So you can think this is a measure of graph density. So the larger n q, the graph gets denser. And now uh, I'm going to show you the state of the art for this problem, and we're focused on the polynomial time algorithms. Uh, in this table here, we look into two dimension. One dimension corresponding to this correlation parameter rho, the other dimension corresponding to n times q. So we divide it into a different region. And the study for this graph matching problem can be traced back to last centuries. A lot of famous researchers like Barbai, Erdos, a lot of us have studied this problem, but they focus on the region when the correlation is to one. So this is when the two networks, they're perfectly correlated. So they're isomorphic to each other. And then the problem leads to, okay, what if they do not look exactly the same? And then the, in the past decades, these are some exciting works where researchers develop efficient algorithm that could recover this hidden user correspondence or no correspondence between the two networks. But they require the noise between the two networks to vanish as a graph size diverge. In the past three years, there's some uh, more exciting works where researchers develop algorithm where the algorithm could tolerate some constant level of noise. So here, uh, the algorithm could work when the correlation is some constant smaller than one. However, there are two limitations. One is that this correlation, the constant is unspecified. So they were just saying you have to pick a constant that's really close to one. Second is that all these algorithms only work for the sparse regimes. 
So the open problems in this field before we study this is that can you develop a fishing algorithm that could work for both sparse and dense graph and also allow the correlation to be low correlation. And our contribution here is that our work is the first, uh, proposed the first uh, polynomial time algorithm that could work as long as this correlation is larger than the square root of this other street counting constant. If you go above this ratio, then our algorithm work for both sparse and dense graphs. And the Otter's constant here, uh, let me briefly introduce to you. So this is introduced by Richard Otter in 1948. So if you want to count how many unlabeled trees, the size of the family when the tree size grow, grows, is the, the family size itself grows exponential with respect to the tree size, and the growth rate is this one of Otter's constant. So uh, now, uh, by the way, so there is a subsequent work by Gonzali, Masuli, and Somanjian where they also propose an algorithm. Well, their work is limited to the sparse graphs, and another difference uh, from our work is that there could be some uh, mismatchings in their algorithms. Now let me uh, talk about our main result. So what we show is that if the correlation is larger than the square root of this other street counting constant, then as the graph size diverge, our algorithm works in polynomial time. And if the average degree of each network is larger than a constant C, then our algorithm could achieve partial recovery. That means we can correctly identify a positive constant fraction of no nodes between the two network. And as the graph, size, uh, graph gets denser, say the average degree diverge as the graph size diverge, then our algorithm could achieve almost exact recovery. That means we can almost correctly map the nodes between the two network. And when the graph gets even denser such that this condition here is satisfied, then we can achieve exact recovery. That means we can correctly identify every like users between those two networks. Let me briefly emphasize two things. One is that all this algorithm here, we do not uh, have any mismatching error. So that means all the output in the algorithm will give you the correct answers, like which user corresponds to which user between the two network. Another thing is if you look into this highlighted condition here, so this is, so, so if, you, if you look into the intersection graph between the two network, so the intersection graph here I'm referring to is also a network that contains all the users where each two nodes are connected if they're both connected in A and B. Then the intersection graph itself is also a in random graph with N nodes, and this is its edge probability. So then the condition is translated to that uh, this is the connectivity threshold of the intersection graph. In other words, if you go below the threshold, then the intersection graph, this network will contain many isolated users, so there is no way that you can distinguish them. In other words, this condition is necessary if you want to achieve exact recovery. So now let me briefly uh, talk about uh, our main result in, in using this phase transition diagram. Wait, so let's, yes. So here, okay, I followed that uh, for the third condition, you needed uh, information theoretically that yeah. for exact recovery. Right. But then there's also the condition on the otter constant. Yes, right? yes, yes. So that's not so obviously necessary, information so theoretically? So information theoretically doesn't require it has to be other streak uh, yeah. con constant, but our algorithm required that. In fact, we believe in the sparse regimes that, like for example, uh, NQ is larger than some constant lock in that regime, yeah. and that is the computation threshold. Yes, for the sparse graphs. But if you go denser graphs, then we actually believe that rho can be any like constant as, uh, as long as it's not vanishing. So here is a phase transition diagram, and we focus on the region when the average degree goes to some constant lambda time log n. And in our previous works, also uh, Kalina and Kiavash work, we showed that this curve here is information theoretical limit that if you go below the curve, then there's no algorithm could achieve exact recovery, regardless of uh, computational efficiency. And above this is called the possible regime. And our work is showing that if the correlation is larger than the square root of this other tree con constant, then the, there is a polynomial time al possible algorithm could achieve the exact recovery. 
And what is believed is that, um, oh, by the way, sorry. So as you can see, this gray region and this green region that touches on the information theoretical limit thresholds, that implies that under when lambda falls into this region here, then our algorithm is information theoretically optimal. So the right region here is what um, is conjectured to be hard. That means if you go below this right show, then there is no polynomial time algorithm could achieve the exact recovery. But this is only for the sparse regimes. If you go to denser regimes, um, we actually believe rho can be any constant. So now let me briefly talk about our algorithm, like how we <coughs> achieve this recovery in general. Uh, let's still look into this toy example here. For simplicity, I just label the nodes using one, two, three, four, five. The goal is I want to find the mapping, map the nodes from A to B so that I can recover the hidden node correspondence between the two network. And the first step is called signature embedding. So I look into the structure, say, of A, and then I want to do this feature engineering so that I can capture the feature for each vertex on this network. For example, one feature you can think about is just using the degree information uh, it can, could be more complicated than that, but you can come up with a rule so that you can capture this feature for each vertex and let's denote the signatures or features using S1 and S5 for vertexes on A. We can follow the same rule to capture like the features for each vertex on B and denote it using T1 to T5. And having the signatures for every vertex in A and every vertex for B, then I'm going to compute the similarity score. That is say, uh, let's fix a vertex I in A, a vertex J in B. Then the score between these two vertices are computed based on the signatures of these two vertex vertices. And what we want is that if these two vertex, they're the true correspondence. In other words, they correspond to the same user, then we want the score to be high enough. If they are the fake pair, then we want the score to be relatively small. And the question becomes how we construct such a signature, how we construct such a feature so that it can satisfy our purpose here. So here are some examples. One is, as I mentioned, you can just use the degree information. So this is actually not okay because it's possible that multiple nodes are all have really large degree and there is no way that you can distinguish which vertex is which. Um, then how about we use more information, like your neighbor's degree information. So this actually works, but this only works when rho satisfies this condition here. The reason is that if the correlation gets smaller and below the threshold here, then the, the one vertex neighborhood can be very different from the, its neighborhood on another network. So you using the neighborhood, like just the one half neighbor's information is not enough. So let's think about uh, how about we conclude more like instead of just one hop neighborhood, how about like M hop neighborhood? And then these are some algorithms developed by these researchers such that they actually utilize the M hop neighborhood information. The good thing is that uh, it, it uses more information, but the tricky thing here is that it requires the local neighborhood to be a tree structure. So that's why all of these algorithms listed here they require the graph to be sparse. If the graph is too dense, so it cannot be a tree structure, so it doesn't work. So all of this uh, list in here, the, we can see it's either sensitive to noise or only works for the sparse graphs. Then we need something completely new. So our idea is using subgraph count. So let me <laughs> remind you. So let's see this is graph A. And we, want, we have a subgraph H, which is a vag containing two edges. Then the subgraph count of H in A just count how many copies of H appears in A. So in this example here, you can count as six copies. And you can see this is one way you can grab some global information about the network structure. Okay. And this is actually very popular in both practice theory, um, which reminds you maybe of the motive counting. But the issue here, if you remember, is that we want to capture the vertex information. We want this local information stuff, instead of capturing the graphs global-wise information. So that leads to, okay, how about we count the rooted cell graph? So here, let's pick a, like a node, solid nodes in H, so it's become a rooted subgraph. 
then I'm going to capture the information of vertex i. Then I can count how many rooted subgraph h rooted at vertex i appears in a. And as you can see, here are three copies of that. And we can denote this counting as w i h a. So i is the vertex, I try to capture the information. h is the rooted subgraph, a is a network, I conduct analysis. So this is when we can capture some vertex information. So the idea of our algorithm is we want to construct a rich family of rooted subgraph so that each rooted subgraph, by counting it, it can capture some information about the vertex. Then I can combine all the informations like across this family so that my vertex signature or my vertex feature is informative. Okay. And now um, I'm going to show you a roadmap. So the first step is, okay, this is just a toy example. I construct a family of rooted subgraph. Each rooted subgraph contains four edges here. So capital N denotes the number of edges for each rooted subgraph in this family. And the solid node represents the root. As you can see, they're all um, non-isomorphic with respect to each other. And then for each vertex i in A, I'm going to construct a signature. So a signature is a vector each entry corresponding to a counting of a particular h in this, say, this subgraph in this family uh, with respect to vertex i appears in A. So by having this family, I can construct a signature that is a vector. But the issue by directly doing this counting is that you can, you can uh, notice that the entry-wise can be highly correlated with each other. So this can uh, bring some issue because what we want is that different rooted subgraph can capture some different aspect information about the vertex. So we want to solve this high correlation issue. And then what we did is doing the centering. So we, do, we, we center the adjacency matrix so we can treat A as a complete graph and each two vertices are connected. And each edge on this complete version of A has a corresponding weight is given by the center adjacency matrix. And then we're going to count the weighted copy of H rooted I appears in this um, centered A. And we call this as the rooted sign subgraph counting method. And by doing this, you can show that all the entries becomes uncorrelated with each other. So we resolve this high correlation issue. We can do the same thing for each vertex in J and construct this uh, signature, which is a vector. And what we do is similarly counting the rooted sign or weighted subgraph of each subgraph in this family. And then we're going to compute the similar score between each pair of vertex i in A and J in B. And what we do is taking the weighted inner product such that each rooted subgraph is corresponding weight is given by the number of automorphism of this subgraph here. Okay. And then we're going to match this two vertices i and j if the score is above certain threshold and don't match them if it's below the threshold. All right. <laughs> yes. How large is the subgraph? Oh, so I will show you, it, we'll pick it like logarithmic with, with respect to n. But, but here is just a toy example, let's just say uh, the subgraph size equals to four. And then uh, another thing we can notice that if i and j, they're a true pair, then for the same rooted subgraph, it's counting at vertex i in A versus counting at root has, root, uh, vertex j in B, these two quantities are correlated only if the two vertex, uh, vertices, they are true pair. Otherwise, they're um, uncorrelated. So having this good property, we can compute the first moment of the score here. So that when i and j, they're a fake pair, since these two quantities are uncorrelated, then, oh, sorry. So those two quantities, they're uncorrelated, so the first moment will equal to zero. So that's why the score in expectation equals to zero if i and j, they're a fake pair. And if they're true pair, then we can compute the, the mean, it will equal to some point mu that is far away from zero. So we have this good property that is the mean separation between the true, ca true pair case and the fake pair case, which is not enough. We also want the score to have like, um, relatively small fluctuations so that it can center around its mean under both cases. 
So this is the ideal case we want. For example, under the fake pair, we want the score to be highly concentrated around zero. For a true pair, it's concentrated around mu. So by the way, the reason we want the high concentration around zero because we have uh, more fake pairs in, in the matching. Then if we have this ideal case, we can pick a threshold tau between these two zero and mu, and then we're going to match all the vertices if their score is above the threshold and don't match them otherwise. As you can see that all the true pair will have these distributions on the right hand side of tau, then the problem is solved. But the question is how you can show that the score is um, concentrated around its mean and how we can pick this family so that it can have this good property. Okay, now I'm going to focus the rest of my talk on showing you how we choose this family of rooted subgraphs. Let's look into the score here. So talk about fluctuation is equivalent to, let's say, looking to the second moment of the score. And compute the second moment, you need to expand the summation here. So if you ignore the cross correlation between different terms within, within the summation when you compute second moment, then you can compute the variance between the score versus the mu square. And this is roughly on the order of one divided by the cardinality of this family times some quantity depends on the correlation and the size of the subgraph. So all this calculation I'm showing on this slide here is based on I'm ignoring the cross correlation within different terms in the summation when I expand it. If I ignore the cross correlation, then I'll have this good property here. And then what we want is we want this ratio to convert to zero as a graph size diverge. So it requires two things. One is we need this cardinality of this family to be large enough so that this ratio can be dragged to zero. The second thing is we also need the subgraph to grow with the graph size so that this ratio is relatively small. And having this rich and large uh, requirement, we also need the third requirement, which is we want the subgraph to be simple so that we can count it efficiently. So this rich, large, simple criteria leads to the choice to pick the family to be a family of all trees. Okay. So let's look into uh, each requirement one by one. So as I mentioned in the very beginning of the talk is that the family of trees is actually uh, grows exponential with respect to the tree size, and the growth rate is this one of Arthur's constant. So if you plug in this into this ratio here, you can show that if the correlation is larger than the Arthur's um, tree counting constant, then we have the ratio convert to zero. Another thing is that because we pick H to be tree, it is simple enough, so you can use this color coding algorithm, which is a randomized algorithm that can help us efficiently count how many weighted copies of H appears in the, the graph A and B. Okay, so we're good if we, pick, um, if we pick the family to be a family of all trees. But the issue is all of these calculations is incorrect because we're ignoring the cross correlation between different terms in the summation here. So we cannot ignore this. And that's why uh, it leads to we construct, a f we need to construct a special family of uh, special trees. And what we want about this special family is that first, it can surprise the undesirable cross correlation to control this fluctuations versus mu square. Um, basically, we want to control the, what we, the terms that we just ignore. The second thing is even we restrict this trees to have some special structures, we still want this family to be rich enough so that we can combine the informations and make sure that each signature is informative, uh, as informative as possible. Sorry, rich enough here means it should be dense on the family of like... So roughly, it's just like the, the size of the family of all yeah, trees. To the, yeah. Yes, yes. And this is what we pick is uh, what we construct and we give it a name called chandeliers. The reason is because um, it looks like this Amazon <laughs> chandeliers. Um, so the solid node is we call as root. The red part are wires. So each wire is a pass with capital M number of edges. The blue parts are the bulbs. So each bulb is a root of subtrees with capital K number of edges. And in this toy example here, the chandelier have five branches. Okay. And one thing we notice that 
as long as we pick the bulb, the size of the bulb to be much larger than the size of the wire, then we have enough freedom at the bottom of the trees so that we can still ensure that this family is almost as rich as the family of all trees. Okay. So then we have uh, the second requirement is satisfied. Okay. And then let's, I will show you some intuitions why picking this special structure of chandeliers can control the undesirable cross correlations in the last few slides. But let's first assume that this is uh, the correct way to pick the special family of trees. Then we can have the following calculation holds. So the variance divided by mu squared when i and j, their fake pairs, is, will be on the order of one divided by the cardinality of this family times this quantity depends on rho and the size of the tree. So this, you can show that if the correlation is larger than the square root of the outer three cone constant, and the size of the tree, sub, like chandelier, is logarithmic with respect to the graph size of a and b, then this ratio will be little old one divided by n squared. That's why we'll have this high concentration around zero for fake pair. And for true pair, you can show that this ratio is on the order of L is the number of branches in my chandelier. So if we can have this condition satisfied, then we'll have little o1 for true pair. Then we have this concentration around mu for uh, when i and j, they're the true correspondence. Then let's pick a threshold between zero and mu. And we're going to match all the vertices pair, like i and j, if their score is above the threshold. So as you can see that if I follow this way, I won't match any fake pairs. But the issue is that there will be a tiny like slot here, which are true pairs that I won't output in my algorithm. So that's why if you follow this way, you could only achieve almost exact recovery. And the next step is we need some boosting algorithm to achieve exact recovery. So the idea is that now I have the almost exact recovery. I almost match all the vertices between the two graphs. Then I can treat all these matched vertices as seed and using the seed and its neighborhood information to gradually match the remaining vertices. So that's why when this threshold is satisfied, then our algorithm can use a boosting algorithm to achieve exact recovery. So last, let me talk about why do chandeliers work. So the key is we want to compute the second moment. And to compute the second moment, you need to expand the summation. And this will lead to compute the covariance with respect to this term here. So this term will involve, we need to enumerate and analyze all possible overlapping patterns with respect to four rooted trees. And this is the most difficult part in our analysis, and that's why we choose chandeliers. So what we figure out is that when the union graph of these four rooted trees, if it contains a cycle, then this case will contribute less to the variance. But when the union graph of these four rooted trees is indeed a tree, then this will be the dominating term in the variance calculation. So in other words, if you want to control this variance to be small, it's sufficient just to look into the case when the union graph of four trees are tree. Okay. And let's look into a toy example here. So let's just look into just overlapping pattern with respect to two simple chandeliers. And here we have two chandelier. Each chandelier only have two branches. And let's look into how they can overlap with each other. And there are two cases. One is that the branch of the two chandelier, they overlap, but they branch out. However, the bulb touch with each other. So that's why you will form a cycle in the first case. But in the second case is that once the branch, they touch with each other, they branch out, they don't touch with each other anymore, then you will have a tree. So basically, the special structure of the chandeliers tells you that if you want to form a union graph to be a tree, once the, the, the branch, they overlap, but they separate out, they could not touch with each other. So having this special structure can help us to analyze how the trees are overlap and reduce uh, the, the, the variance terms in terms of calculation. Okay. Now let me quickly summarize on the property of the chandeliers. The first thing is we're going to pick the chandeliers to be on 
logarithmic with respect to the graph size so that um, it is large enough. The second is we also need to ensure the richness of this family. So we need the bulbs to be much larger than the, uh, than the wire so that the family of the chandeliers is almost as rich as the family of all trees. There is a very interesting point is that when the graph A and B get sponsor, then we will need the chandelier to have a longer wire and uh, in other words, we need to dig deeper into the neighborhoods so that the algorithm is robust. Another thing I want to uh, talk about is that there is an ongoing work by another group of researchers where they change the bulbs from subtree to bounded tree with subgraphs. And they can show utilizing the special structure of the chandeliers, then they could achieve any constant, row to be any constant in the dense regimes for A and B. So in our case, because we pick this um, sub, like bulbs to be sub tr like tree, so that's why we can at best achieve this outer tree counting constant. But if you can make this family to be richer and still utilize the chandelier structures, you can make this correlation to be smaller. But this only works for the dense regimes. Okay. Now let me talk about some open problems. So the first one is um, let's study graph matching problem and there are other graph models, uh, which like random geometric graph models, random growing graph models, stochastic block models, et cetera. And the second uh, direction is develop some robust algorithm. For example, the earth correlated model I just introduced you, you can also view that these two graph are subsampled from the same parent graph. So what if we change this parent graph instead of the earth chain random graph to be any other structure of the graph, um, but still utilize this subsampling to get A and B? And can we develop some robust algorithm that could work in terms of more general graph model? The third is the computation of phase transition for random graph matching. Can we uh, prove the hardness regime is indeed hard? And lastly is the database matching. So all the matchings I'm showing you here is utilize the edge connections between nodes. What if we use attribute information? And here is a, sorry, <laughs> the slides, okay. Here is some new exciting result just posted uh, this month by uh, Jian Ding and his co-author Zhang Song Li. And they show that they develop another new algorithm uh, can achieve uh, vanish, uh, non-vanishing correlations for the dense or the strain case and the correlated Gaussian Wigner model. Okay. And you can also check it online. Yes, yeah, so that's it. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there is any. Oh yeah, I didn't measure, yes. Yeah, so, um, can you say something about that? Yeah, so that's by uh, Gansali and Masoli and Sermangin's work. So they're looking at the local algorithm where they, uh, they're looking, so because in the sparse regimes, you look into the local neighborhood, it will be like a Gotham Wilson tree structure. So they utilize that and they show that kind of algorithm they develop fails if you go below the threshold. But for more general algorithm, I think it remains an open problem. Sorry, what? Uh, it's just like local neighborhoods. Like yeah. local. Yes, yes. So you mean the, yes, yes, it's like the spectral algorithms or other like algorithm can be, like I show it in the state of the art, the chart. Those algorithms, some of them can have um, better uh, like uh, running time compared to ours. But our, uh, sorry, is so that? And then just means if you're counting logarithmic size subgraphs and then you need like all the three bits if you want to be able to do it uh, in polynomial time. But if you, if you just want a quasi polynomial time, like um, oh, yeah. to the log n, then maybe I know, something becomes easier uh, or, or like you can avoid the, the three outer constants. Is, is, is something like that true or? I, I think. 
so I haven't verified, but I agree with you that if you don't, like, if you allow the time to be like unlocked in and like even more large running, running time, then you could include more subgraph structures and uh, it can achieve better threshold in terms of the correlation role. 